Absolutely. All right. So the next guests that we are having on are the um, the Brady Goats, the first Tech Challenge team, uh, 15772. They've been competing for two seasons, um, and they were the winning alliance in the first pick and the Inspire Award winner at the New Hampshire Championship this year, as well as the winning captain at the Vermont Championship. Uh, they're based out of Bishop Brady High School in Concord. Um, and yeah, here they are. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. We are team 15772, the Brady Goats. Um, our presentation that we will be presenting today is on maximizing blocks programming and uh, season and game strategy. Okay, so who are we? We are a high school team from New Hampshire. This is our second year competing um, we won the Inspire Award winner, as well as the Winning Alliance Captain uh, first pick at the New Hampshire State Competition this year. And we were also the Winning Alliance Captain at the Vermont State Championship. So meeting your presenters. Um, Angelica, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself first? I think you're on mute. So I'm Angelica. I've been in FTC for two years and first for six years. I will be a junior in high school next year. I'm the head programmer and the business lead of Brady Goats. And I was a 2020 New Hampshire FTC Dean's List Award. Okay, and then my name is Nick. Um, this was my first year in FTC but I've done seven years of first in total. Um, next year is going to be my senior year. Um, I am the team captain as well as the uh, design lead. And I've been on an FLL team, an FTC team and an FRC team uh, during my time in first. So the first thing I'm going to be covering is maximizing blocks programming. So even though this is our team second year in FTC, we want to do box programming. So I'm going to talk about a bit about one of the ways to use box programming to be more competitive. So first I'm going to show our um, greatest auto that we've made so far with blocks. So it's a 43 point auto for the Skystone season. So we're first detecting the Skystone using Vuforia, and then we go to intake the Skystone. Once we intake it, we back up and we line up to the foundation while we're placing the Skystone on. And then we rotate the foundation and put it into the build site and go to get the second Skystone. Once we get the second Skystone, we'll go back to the foundation, place it on, and then park. So one of the things that you can do with your robot is you can have many sensors on your robot. So we used a lot of sensors in our robot with blocks programming. So you can use touch sensors and also magnetic limit switches. So you would use that with an if press block, and then you can use it for multiple um, actions. So you could reset an encoder value to zero. You can cause an action, like if a stone presses the touch sensor, it would automatically grip the stone. Or you can use the touch sensors or mag magnetic limit switches to stop an action, like the intake arms cannot lo lower if the sensor is pressed. So on the left, you see a clip of um, our code that shows that if the box sensor is pressed, then it'll automatically grip the stone in the intake. So 
So for more sensors, so the Rev3 Born encoder or an external encoder could be used. So it would be programmed just like a normal motor encoder, like you would use on your drive base. So you can use it for multiple ways like odometry to track your position on the field, or you can also use it as an encoder for a continuous servo, like for limits, since the servo does not have an encoder value like a motor does. You can also use a motor encoder. That's just a normal motor, but it's still a sensor. So you can use it to, um, as limits for a mechanism, like an elevator. And you can also use it to restrict an action. So if you elevate too low, you might not want to swing the revolving arm to place this down. So that's the part of the code on the right. So it shows that if the elevator encoder value is below a certain number, then the revolving arm so just stay in the same position. So more for sensors, you can also use a phone or another external webcam. So there are many resources on how to use this for vision. So there were a lot of resources this year for detecting the sky stone, and there's going to be a lot more in next seasons. So you would use a program like TensorFlow, Vuforia, et cetera, for the vision, so like the sky stone. And it's also helpful to be able to know the position of the sky stone or whatever you're trying to see. So you would know like the X, Y, and Z value. So on the right is another piece of our code. So it's in autonomous the sky stone from knowing the Y position, we will know if it's the left one, the right one, the center one. So then we'll know what actions we have to take to get the sky stone and then the second sky stone, depending on the variable used. So some more about sensors. So you can also use a gyro sensor, which is located in a rev hub. So the control hub or the expansion hub. This would track the axis of the hub pointing up, but it might um, be different depending on how you mounted your expansion or control hub. So you can use an autonomous to turn the robot to a certain degree or to keep the robot moving straight in auto. So the two parts of code I have show the two different um, pieces. So on the left side, it shows just moving straight in auto. So if the rotation around the z-axis is too far to one side, then the motor values will um, change to have the robot turn to the other side. And then if the um, gyro sensor value is between a certain range, then it'll just go forward at a constant speed. And then on the right is the turning to a certain angle. So if I want to turn the robot to negative one degrees, then I would have it know the value of the gyro to turn until it's that um, degree value. So now for servos. So the first part can really be used for a lot of different actions. We just specifically used it with servos. So you can use the same button for an action. So if a servo position is less than a certain number, then it would go to the opposite position. So this is really useful to be able to use less buttons for two actions at the same, same time. So that's what is on the right. So it shows that if you put the B button greater than or equal to 0.7 position, then it'll go the opposite position. Otherwise, it would know that it's at that opposite position and go to the um, position that equals one. With servos, you can also ramp up and ramp down the servo. So if you want to prevent breaking a mechanism, that would be really useful. So you would gradually increase the servo position with a weight in between. So basically, if the servo is too fast, turning on and off will slow it down. So that would help with the ramp up, ramp down. So more on servos. So you can use servos to do a main action and then also trigger another action. So if it's a certain position, it could do the main action, like ripping a stone. But if it's a higher or lower position than that, you can use it to trigger another action, like placing a capstone. So on the right, you'll see that we use the left bumper to be able to just place the stone. But then the right bumper, it would change the value of one of the two grippers, and then it would be able to place the capstone also. So it would do two actions at once.
So for variables, you can use variables to remember a past position. So by changing the value by one, depending on the times that button was pressed, and then that would change the action depending on this. So for example, you could press the same button for an automatic elevator, and it will remember the last level that it went to and it will place the stone. So on the right, you'll see that we used a, um, a level variable. So it would change it by one every time we press the button usually, and then it would um, go up with the elevator until it's that certain level, knowing how many times the button was pressed. So more with variables. So you can also use it to do an action only while that variable is true. So an action would trigger another one making the variable true and it would stay true until another action makes it false. So for an example, the intake could start, start the box wheel. So once you press the right bumper as shown in the top left picture, and so that would make the box wheel variable true, but then the automatic gripping would um, make it false and then stop the bo box wheel. So that's how we were able to use the true and false variables. So variables, you can limit action to only do it once. So you could do the action when it's the variable equals zero, but then change it by one at the end of the action. So then it would only do that action one time. You can also use variables to remember a past action. So you would set that last action of something true when you were doing it, but right when you stop it, it does an action and set that sets that last action to false. So it would only do it once. So that's what you would see on the left. So when we did the left bumper, that would be outtaking the stone and it would set that variable to true. And then if that variable is true, it would put the elevator automatically down and then set it to false. So it doesn't keep pushing down the elevator and break the robot. So for more variables, you can do multiple actions in a loop. So for example, in auto, there's usually a loop how, I, how we used it. So it would repeat stuff in the loop like telemetry or something like that until the robot has gone a certain distance. So you would set a variable like we have ex elevator one to true and then have an action in the loop happen while that is true. But then right after that, it would set it to false when the action is done then do another action since it's not true anymore. So that's what's on the left. We set it to true before the loop. So it could do it in parallel with an action and just have two different actions still happening. You can also have a pause in the loop like that. So for one of the variable sections above, you have a variable that increases by one each time it goes through the loop and then a and then stop or start an action when this variable is a certain number. So it's just like a counter every time it goes through the loop, it would change by one. So you can also change a speed depending on the number of times a button was pressed using variables. So if the button was pressed, you would change the variable by one. And then if the variable equals one, it would have a certain speed. But then if you press the button again, it would equal two or just greater than one and it would have a different speed. So we use that when we're placing our taller capstone. So our like pop-up type, we would have the speed be slower the first time we press the button. But then the second time we press it, we'd be able to go down full speed once the capstone's on the skyscraper. So now it's Nick's turn. Um, so, Angelica, do you mind uh, full screening the presentation? Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about the season robot and game strategy.
as shown on the screen. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about season strategy. And um, this includes um, some, some goals that your team should consider um, before the season starts. Um, and based on these goals, um, you should try to figure out how to best achieve them. So the first one is competition or competition goals. Um, so one of your goals might be to win a qualifier um, or get picked at states at the state competition. Um, then there are advancement goals, um, such as advancing to uh, your state's state competition, um, advancing to the world competition, or um, being invited to an off-season in invitational, such as the Maryland Tech in Invitational. Um, and based on these goals, like I said before, um, you should, your team should try to figure out how to best um, position yourself to achieve those goals. So now I'm going to talk about our um, season strategy for the Skystone season, which was the past season. Um, so for advancement goals, our uh, probably most important goal for the entire season was to advance to the world championship. And since we um, are in the state of New Hampshire, only two teams go to um, the world championship uh, based off uh, how you rank in your um, at the state competition. And one of, one of the places that goes, uh, goes to this uh, world championship is the first place Inspire Award and the other is the winning Alliance captain um, of the robot game. So um, when we thought about this goal, we um, first tried to think about how to um, position ourselves to advance to the world championship. And so the first step was to advance to the state competition in New Hampshire. And to do this, we had to rank high enough um, at the qualifier competitions. And um, uh, luckily we did uh, do that. And I'm sure the same thing um, goes for many other states in the US. Uh, then at the New Hampshire state competition, like I said, only two places go to the world championship, uh, the first place Inspire and the winning Alliance captain of the robot game. And since um, gluten-free 11115 um, uh, lives in New Hampshire, um, and since they are one of the best teams in the world, we knew that we had a very slim chance of being the winning Alliance captain for the robot game. So um, we wanted to really do well in the robot game, but we also focused on um, winning the first place Inspire Award uh, in order to qualify our team for the world championship. Um, we also uh, attended the Vermont State Championship, which was the day before the New, the New Hampshire State Championship. Um, and only the first place Inspire Award winner um, at the Vermont State Championship um, advances to the World Championship. And so we didn't win um, the first place Inspire there, but um, the competition was great because um, we got a lot of robot driver practice in. Um, before the New Hampshire State Competition the next day. And then um, the other way of advancing to the World Championship, um, besides uh, your placement at the state, state competitions, is through the FTC World's Lottery. Um, however, uh, I wasn't, we weren't able to figure out uh, the chance of advancement um, through the World's Lottery because we, um, I'm pretty sure 16 teams from the lottery advanced to the uh, world championship, but no one really knows how many teams are in that lottery. So we definitely didn't want to uh, bank on that. And so um, in the end, we were the winning Alliance first pick at the New Hampshire state competition, as well as the first place Inspire award winner. So um, we did advance to the world championship. Okay, next one I'm going to talk about is robot strategy. Um, since the robot often has a major effect on your season goals and should be thought about going into the season. 
So um, one question you should think about is, do you want a robot to be simple or complex? And there are many um, downsides and advantages uh, to both of these strategies, um, such as uh, fixing your robot or um, uh, improving your robot throughout the season. Uh, another thing you should think about is how to maximize your team's abilities. Um, and many teams use the summer um, or the off season to um, improve your skills. And we also did this um, over the summer. And another thing you should consider are, are your um, season goals feasible, uh, your robot and season goals feasible um, with the resources you have. And this is something that um, is very important because um, if you don't have um, a lot of time uh, to meet every week or um, you don't have many tools, then uh, some of your goals might not be um, very achievable. So you should definitely consider your resources before um, the season when you're making your goals. So now I'm going to talk about our um, robot strategy um, going into the Skystone season. So we wanted to build a simple and robust robot since um, simple and robust robots are often easier to fix and also um, easier to improve uh, as the season progresses. Um, we also started designing our drive base prior to the season in, in order to give ourselves more time during the season to um, improve and build better um, mechanisms such as the intake or the, um, the elevator or the placement mechanism. Um, another goal of ours for the robot was to complete um, all the game tasks quickly and efficiently. Um, even if we weren't going to be the best in the world at everything, we wanted to be well-rounded. Um, and then we also used um, many go build a parts and 3D printed parts um, on our robot, as you can see in the picture. And that was mostly for consistency so that at a competition um, or at our uh, workshop, if a part of the robot broke, we could always um, replace it or fix it easier um, with another part that we might have. Okay, and then the last um, section that I'm going to be talking about is um, the game strategy. So um, like the robot strategy, the game strategy is also going to have an effect on um, how you build your robot and the outcome of your season. And these are some questions that you should, your team should consider. Um, so you wanna consider what type of partner do you want or do you want to be? Um, such as for the Skystone season, do you want to be the stacking robot who stacks the stones on the foundation, or do you want to be the team um, that shuttles the stones uh, to the team stacking? And um, there's really advantages to both of these strategies. Um, at the World Championship or at other competitions, there's usually um, roles for each alliance partner. And so um, whatever role that your team um, is playing in a match, you want you usually want to uh, be the best robot and partner that you can be. Um, and then you also want to consider when looking at the game, uh, what's the easiest or the best path to, vi to victory? Um, so for example, in the 2018, 2019 FTC game, which was Rover Ruckus, um, there were many different um, ways of scoring, such as um, bringing the minerals to the, um, the square in the corner or placing it in the lander, placing the minerals in the lander. And so um, while many teams tried, um, in New Hampshire at least, to place in the lander at the state competition, um, we specialized at bringing them to the, um, the square in the corner. And while that might not be as many points, um, we we're pretty fast at doing it um, and consistent. And so um, another thing I wanna say about that is that auto is often um, a key to victory um, when looking at the game. Um, for example, this year, um, a, a really good score might've been a hundred points. And if you could get 40 points in auto, then 
um, that's a huge um, advantage over the other alliance. And then also um, you wanna think about which game ob objectives do you want to prioritize? Meaning um, maybe it's um, intaking stones first and then placing stones later in the season, or maybe it's placing stones um, early in the season and then intaking the stones um, later in the season. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about our game strategy for the uh, Skystone season. So um, we wanted to have the ability to complete all tasks, game tasks uh, quickly and efficiently, as I said earlier. Um, we prioritize fast intaking and um, efficient intaking early on in the season. And then later we focused on stacking the stones and auto. And so um, as I've heard in some of the other presentations today, um, you definitely want to set, set aside a lot of time for auto um, in order to be really competitive because a lot of teams forget about auto um, going into competitions and um, the other teams who have uh, set, set aside a lot of time for auto um, have a huge, huge advantage. Um, and then uh, the main strategy at the New Ham Hampshire and Vermont State Championships for our team was to show consistency and compatibility with the other teams because we wanted to be um, the best alliance partner that we could be while also um, being consistent in every match and um, doing the same thing. And then at the um, Maryland Tech Invitational and the World Competition, we would have, um, if the competition had been held, um, we would have prioritized consistency, just like at the New Hampshire and Vermont State Championships. Um, we also would have prioritized double capping, which is where you uh, place another capstone along with your partner, because um, not a lot of alliances are able to do that. And that would have given um, our alliance um, a huge advantage over the other alliances. Um, we also would have prioritized shuttling and um, along with that driver practice. And this is because we knew that we weren't going to be the best um, stacking robot. So we really wanted to show that we can uh, be a great Alliance partner and bring stones to the stacking team um, with consistency and um, with a lot of driver practice um, having been done. And the last thing I'm going to talk about are uh, kickoff strategies, meaning the, some strategies that your team might want to um, use when the game is first revealed. So um, on the day of the kickoff, um, your team should probably watch the game reveal uh, live. Uh, it's usually held in New Hampshire. So unless you live in New Hampshire, um, you probably can't um, go to the official kickoff, but you might be able to go to a local one or watch it on YouTube. Um, your team should probably read the game manuals fully when the game first comes out, because um, you don't wanna break any rules going in competitions and you don't wanna build a robot that does something that's illegal or um, something like that. Um, you should discuss the scoring elements and not necessarily how to um, accomplish the uh, scoring element, but um, which ones do you want to do, which ones do you want to prioritize, and uh, other things like that. And then you should also discuss, like I said, um, what you want your robot to do, not how, um, at least for the first week or so. And then after that, uh, you should discuss ideas for how to complete the tasks that your team wants to um, complete. Okay, and that is all we have for our presentation. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, hello, um, hello again. Um, so um, our first question from the chat is, what is the best possible auto? This was asked during the um, uh, portion of the the block programming portion of the um, uh, the block yeah the block 
programming portions yeah. for Angelica? Yeah, so it really depends on the team, I guess. For us, the most, like the best auto and the one that we could likely achieve was to do a two sky stone placing foundation auto. But if a team has odometry, then they can go and do like six stones and all of them play stuff like that. So it really depends on the team and what how experienced they are in programming. Yeah, so I think the best possible score was um, 72 or something like that. But um, most of the teams that were scoring up in the 60s and 70s were using odometry or other um, complex uh, programming and mechanical systems. So uh, with blocks programming, we were able to have a 40 point auto, um, which is pretty competitive, at least in New Hampshire. Okay. Um, so uh, have you um, ever in implemented any custom uh, sensors with block programming? Like, is there, yeah. Yeah, so we used a lot of sensors this past year. So we used like the phone camera to detect the sky stone. We used the gyro sensor in the Rev Expansion Hub to be able to move in a straight line or turn to a certain angle. We used the touch sensors and man magnetic limit switches as limits for different actions or to reset an encoder value. We used like the normal motor encoders as um, limits for different actions like the elevator and then also for driving to a certain distance in auto. We also did play around a bit with the dis distance sensor and with the color sensor and tried to do autos with that, but we found that they weren't too reliable, but yeah. Cool. Um, so we have um, another question. Uh, so the, um, the pandemic has been really hard on all teams. Uh, we just wanna know like what you've been doing uh, outside of FIRST during the pandemic. So um, we haven't been able to meet as a team, obviously, uh, because of the pandemic, but we have been able to work a little bit at our house since Angelica and I are siblings. And so um, she was able to complete the auto that she showed um, a few weeks ago or a week ago. Um, we're also making a reveal video for our robot that should be out um, in a couple days. Um, and then I think we've just been each doing our personal stuff like um, preparing for school next year or um, robotics next year or whatever else. Cool. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we do have, we have another question from the chat here um, from our mentors on 1073. So you guys have seen, you have built some like substantial robot control logic and blocks. Um, can you describe the, the tools and techniques you use to de debug your code? Yeah, so basically if we find that something's not working, we have to just really like thoroughly review that part in the code. It's not like usually with Java, there's things that I'll say like there's an error with something. So I guess we just have to really look at like what seems out of place or if we know like a distance is off, check if there's a variable missing or something like if we're just missing something or if a whole section of code it just got like, um, like put in wrong, I guess. Yeah, another thing that we do is um, if we have like a whole program and we have a, a major problem with the program, we try to narrow it down um, to figure out where the problem is and then how to fix it. So we might um, like break up the program into pieces and then run each piece um, to make sure that each part is good and then figure out wh uh, where the problem is and how to fix it. Does your team predict uh, categories of robots? Um, yeah, so we, we definitely did that at the beginning of the season where um, we try to figure out the game strategy um, and how it's going to be played and then also how we can be best be the or be, be the best alliance partner. So um, at the beginning of the season, we might've thought about having a, a stacking robot where uh, you place up to 10 stones or a stacking robot where you can only place four stones. Um, 
or um, having a robot where you shuttle the stones from the depot to the other robot that's placing. And so we definitely did that uh, at the beginning of the season. All right. And then we have a question here from the Blue Box team. Um, they're wondering if you've ever tried using Java and what your opinion is uh, between the two different programming languages. Yes, so we've started using Java for FTC. After doing a year of doing some Java with FRC, we decided that we can try Java next year. So we've started doing a bit with odometry with it, as well as just the basics. I guess it's a lot easier to be able to read the code and be able to like type stuff in instead of dragging and dropping as well like as scrolling. So I think it'll definitely be a better change. But if you're not ready for it, or if you like are a first or second year team, then I think definitely blocks is really good, especially if you're able to maximize your use of blocks like we were able to do this season. Yeah, and we also, um, we see a lot of teams try to jump right into Java um, when they're only uh, maybe a rookie team or first year team or a second year team. Um, and then they, um, they might not have as good of an auto as a team that has really maximized blocks um, or on any other simple um, system or programming um, thing. Um, what aspects of the game do you try to initially notice at kickoff? Uh, so we usually try to figure out um, like what the main objective is, which this year was placing the stones on the foundation in a tower and making it as uh, tall as you can. Um, but then there's smaller objectives such as um, moving the foundation or um, placing your capstone or something like that. So we usually focus on the main objective, which was, like I said, stacking the stones. Um, early in the season. And then um, we also um, focus, but not as much time on um, moving the foundation or um, other smaller tasks. All right. We have a question in the chat here. Um, what kind of sensors do you use on your robot? So we use a lot of sensors. So like the phone camera, the gyro sensor, touch sensors and magnetic limit switches. We've used the distance sensor and color sensor a bit, as well as like the potentiometer for just learning how to use it. We also used the Rev 3 bore encoder on our past version of our robot. Nice. Um, what advice would you provide to new teams that are using blocks for the first time? What resources are, are available? What is the fastest path to proficiency in your opinion? So the advice that I would give is to start simple and smart, start with like not a full on like competition robot. So how we learned programming is we had just like a control hub set up with one motor plugged in or maybe one sensor too, to just be able to learn the basics of programming with blocks. So then you'd be able to learn later to do the more complex things also with that, and then gradually move over to the competition robot. There's a lot of different resources out there. So there's like the first programming blocks document. There's a lot of good YouTube videos also, and then as well as normal, just like FTC teams in your area or connect with them on social media to ask questions. And I think the path to proficiency is just really starting simple and gradually building up your experience. So if you do it for like one to two years, then you'll later become more experienced in blocks, then you're ready to transition over to Java. All right, we have a question here in that one of our organizers. Uh, so you two have both have, both have experience with FRC and FTC from, what, from your perspective. Can you describe the similarities and differences between the programs and is one harder or easier than the other? Um, so I was on an FRC team for two years and what I found was um, a pretty big difference is that the robots are obviously um, a lot bigger in FRC than FTC, um, but the skills that are used in both um, are pretty similar. 
Um, you might not use a CNC or a mill as much in um, FTC as you would in FRC. Um, you use more uh, like hand tools um, such as drills and Allen uh, wrenches. But um, probably the biggest difference is that, or at least for me, um, watching an FRC game is um, probably a lot more um, entertaining than an FTC game. Um, but definitely the, the skills that are used in both are uh, pretty similar. With me personally, see the first time I was on, it was a lot different since I was just business, no programming at all. So there were a lot of differences between doing just business versus now doing a lot more programming, as well as like the bigger robot, I was just more like tend to, to not want to work on it. But then I joined another team, which that's where I learned a lot of Java this past season. And I guess there's a lot of similarities with learning to program on both robots. But starting with a simple FTC robot is definitely a good way to go. Also, since um, FRC teams are usually bigger than FTC teams, I feel like um, you might have more of a role um, in building the robot or programming the robot on an FTC team than an FRC team. Um, but you, you probably still learn um, the same uh, content in both programs. Kaylee, you're muted. <laughs> My bad, sorry. Um, we have someone in the chat asking if one of you guys can talk more about what things you did to try to win the Inspire Award. So we did a lot for the Inspire Award. We basically read like the rubrics for all of the different awards, like the descriptions and went off of that. So we wanted first like a very strong, thorough engineering notebook. So we looked at examples out there and made ours very detailed to be able to document our team's journey. And then for a lot of different outreach, we did a lot. So some of the examples are like we mentored two FLL teams for multiple months to help them even get to the state competition. We did a lot of volunteering. So at like an animal shelters, walk the animals, we helped out there and at other places. We also demonstrated our robot at multiple events. So like New Hampshire Tech Fest, we went there with our robot to be able to show it to younger kids to get them more interested in FIRST and in STEM in general. Nick, do you wanna talk more about it? Um, yeah, pretty much everything Angelica just said. Um, we did a lot of outreach throughout the season, um, especially during the season um, before um, the competition started. Um, we had a really, really good um, engineering notebook, um, which was uh, a lot improved from uh, the past season. Um, and really this year, we just tried to uh, focus a lot more time on it than we had uh, last season. We also worked to connect with different STEM professionals for like the Connect Award a bit. And then that also goes with um, the Inspire Award. So like we took a tour of a STEM company facility and that was really interesting to learn more about how FTC principles might be used in their company. Yeah, so not not only did we try to uh, win the uh, Inspire Award in New Hampshire, but we also tried to uh, win the other awards, which would also help um, help us win the Inspire Award. Very nice, very nice. Good for you guys. Um, all right, another question here. Is it possible to call a Google block module into a different module? So I'm not sure what that means. So if the person would give a, a bit more of a description, that'd be helpful because so like, I'm still pretty new at programming. So I might not know all the technical terms. All right, we'll skip to the next one here. Um, you mentioned adjusting your strategy because you knew that there was world competition in New Hampshire. How does the lack of a world championship this year change the mindset in 2021? Um, I guess it doesn't really change the mindset in terms of um, not having a world championship, but next year, um, gluten-free, um, I'm pretty sure is not going to be a team next year. So um, we're going to really focus on 
uh, winning the Inspire Award and also winning the Winning Alliance Captain um, at New Hampshire in order to give ourselves the best chance of advancing to the World Championship. Nice. Um, have you guys ever considered making your own voting system for your team specifically? So we have not thought about that, but we could always maybe do that in the future. So we can definitely look into that. Have you gotten to travel outside the state or country as part of your first experience? And if so, what was that like? So um, we did twice or actually once when we were um, in FLL. Um, our last year, we came in third place in the state of New Hampshire and we got to go to the Australia um, competition, uh, which was definitely pretty cool. Um, I think it was for, we went there for a week or two and uh, it was probably my favorite ex experience from um, being on a first team. Then we've also went out of the state twice. So we went to like Vermont this past FTC season and then for 2018, we went to the World Championship in Michigan with our old FRC team. That's so cool. I, yeah, that's awesome. Um, from your experience, how do you envision this season? Like, how do you think that it's going to um, I guess we're not really sure, um, just like everyone else. Um, we're just going to play it as it uh, unfolds. Um, hopefully we can get back to meeting as a full team um, because um, I really love having the whole team uh, together and being able to share ideas. Um, but I guess we'll just have to play it by ear. Yeah, I think we're all feeling pretty similarly right now. Um, have the Brady Goes been involved in developing any personal protective equipment or any other projects during this epidemic or pandemic? So yes, we've been doing a lot of making personal protective equipment, so PPE. We've been mainly using face shields as well as ear savers for cloth face masks. And then we also were able to sew some more cloth face masks. And now we partnered with a local community member who's going to be helping us make more face masks. So we've been able to make almost 4,000 um, pieces of PPE and donate it to over 20 facilities. So that's really cool that we're able to outreach to the community that way. That's amazing. Um, what has been your favorite first experience so far? Uh, I think for me, it was probably the Australian uh, Australia trip, um, but I think the World Championship in 2018 was also pretty cool. I'd agree with Nick. The World Championship was good, but I definitely think Australia was amazing. So we have a couple more questions. In ongoing season, if um, we want to keep Spending our learning sources. Is there a way to keep in touch with your team with your team constantly? Yeah, so we have an Instagram account, so FTC underscore 15772. We also have our Gmail, FTC15772 at gmail.com. So you're able to contact us through those methods. And then you can also set up a Zoom with us if you need more help or just talk to us through e email. So stuff like that. a physical or digital engineering notebook and why did you pick that method? We use a digital engineering notebook so on Google Drive. We found that it would just be a neater way and then also like if we have a lot of pictures and videos that we might be constantly changing we'd be able to import and change those very easily and then if we have a spreadsheet type thing in there that we're constantly updating to waste stuff or change stuff around like that it's just nicer to be able to type it in and then if we want to get it like printed we're able to professionally print it and put it in like a nicer notebook than if you just had a binder with pieces of notebook paper in it yeah absolutely. i definitely see where 
from from most of our stuff with digital too. Um, so you are a relatively new FTC team. What would make starting a new team easier? And I would say that there are a lot of resources online, um, both on Google and on YouTube. So if you ever have a question, you can either uh, go on Google and YouTube or YouTube and um, search it up, or you can reach out to a, a team like us or any other uh, first team, and I'm sure they would be happy to help. How did you prepare for the Inspire interviews? So we basically would review our engineering notebook and see what are the like points that we want to make known to the judges the most. So we would like write on note cards. So we all know like what are the most important points to our team. And then we would also maybe choose some around like certain other awards like the connect award. So we might add about our STEM professionals that we met or about motivate. So about uh, like helping the community learn more at different outreaches. And then we would just practice, practice, practice with our team a lot. Okay, uh, so uh, a 40 point auto is impressive. Uh, how long did it take to develop that auto? Uh, what were the most difficult challenges that you had, had to overcome as you developed it? So the 40 point auto has basically taken all of quarantine. So we had a lot of different autos to um, use during the normal season, but it was never like that complex. It would be just like bringing two sky stones across the line and leaving them there and not doing the foundation or moving the foundation and just getting one random stone and placing it. So that's why I took like all of quarantine to do that, even though we were gradually building throughout the season. So I would say like the most difficult challenge is that in the beginning of the season, we started by using the side arms only for bringing the sky stone across, but then in intake for doing the foundation and placing a random stone auto. So I think that it would have been maybe easier if we had either started with the intake with the sky stones at the beginning or use one of the sidearms that can also grip the stone and place it just because instead of having to combine two ideas, we would already have a stable idea that we'd be able to use for that auto. Another challenge that we came across was that um, we found that um, using blocks and not using our um, odometry um, it was very hard to be 100% consistent every single um, time we ran the auto. So we had to um, kind of fix that with um, having a really good intake that could intake the stone um, with a large margin of error. Um, and I think we might use our um, odometry next year in order to help us be um, more, have, a, have an auto that's more consistent every time you run it. All right, next, so when you guys were traveling to Australia, um, you guys were able to uh, develop a connection with the RC team Thunder Down Under, 31-32, is that correct? Uh, so I guess we didn't um, really talk to them too much, but they, I'm pretty sure they hosted the competition um, that we went to. Um, so that was pretty cool. They also helped our team specific, spe specifically a lot since we were a team of two. And when I ended up in the hospital, they were able to provide one of their team members to help Nick with the robot game practice. So we're really thankful for that. That's awesome. Um, did you ever try differential swerve in FTC? If so, what were the challenges you faced? Uh, we never did. Um, I didn't really know about it until um, Gluten Free put out their uh, video of the differential swerve. Um, we haven't really seen any other teams use one, um, and I'm not 100% sure what the advantages are. Um, so we never ended up using it. Um, but what I've heard, it's pretty complex um, and a lot more complex than um, the Mechanum drive base that we used this year. Um, how long, I know you guys said that you were still working on you know, perfecting 
and things like that. But approximately how many hours do you think you put into developing your autonomous? I don't really know exactly like how many hours, but we usually have like one meeting every weekend that's like six hours long that we would definitely be working on autonomous for probably like three or like three hours of that. And then also probably one hour per week or per, per two weeks in the summer to just learn some other stuff like learning how to use some new sensors or different concepts like that. What was the most difficult to overcome as you developed it? Uh, I asked this question before, Kaylee. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm my laptop. <laughs> um, I was presented at, um, at 1 p.m. earlier today. Were you able to form um, a professional relationship with them by being on the same alliance? Uh, yeah, so we were picked by them at the New Hampshire State Competition uh, this year as their first pick, and then we were their second pick last year um, as a rookie team. And um, personally, um, they were the ones who got me into uh, the first program um, around eight years ago because I went to the um, uh, first or FLL um, camp in Manchester where they um, reveal the game or they used to reveal the game before um, everyone else would see it. And so um, I went to that camp after figuring out that uh, Legos uh, not moving was kind of boring and that I wanted to see um, something like a robot move. Um, and so I went to that camp and they were the, the ones who uh, got me interested in first in the first place. That's it. Uh, we are wrapping up here. Um, and I do believe that was the last question that we had for you guys. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to present today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.